Remember not, Lord Christ, our offenses, nor the offenses of our forefathers, neither reward us according to our sins. Spare us, good Lord, spare thy people, and not as redeemed with thy most precious blood, and by thy mercy preserve us forever. Spare us, good Lord, from all evil and wickedness, from sin, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, and from everlasting damnation. Good Lord, deliver us from all blindness of heart, from pride, vainglory, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, malice, and from all want of charity. Good Lord, deliver us from all inordinate and sinful affections, and from all the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Good Lord, deliver us from all false doctrine, heresy, and schism, from hardness of heart, and contempt of thy word and commandment. From lightning, tempest, from earthquake, fire, and flood, from plague, pestilence, and famine. Good Lord, deliver us. From all oppression, conspiracy, and rebellion, from violence, battle, and murder, and from dying suddenly and unprepared. Good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of thy holy incarnation, by thy holy nativity and submission to the law, by thy baptism, fasting, and temptation. Good Lord, deliver us. By thine agony and bloody sweat, by thy cross and passion, by thy precious death and burial, by thy glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Ghost. Good Lord, deliver us. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of our death, and in the day of judgment. Good Lord, deliver us. We sinners who beseech thee to hear us, O Lord God, and that it may please thee to rule and govern thy holy church universal in the right way. We beseech thee to hear us, O Lord. That it may please thee to illumine all bishops, priests, and deacons with true knowledge and understanding of thy word, and that both by their preaching and living they may set it forth and show it accordingly. We beseech thee to hear us, O Lord. That it may please thee to bless and keep all thy people. that it may please thee to send forth laborers into thy harvest and to draw all mankind into thy kingdom. That it may please thee to give to all people increase of grace to hear and receive thy word and to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. That it may please thee to bring into the way of truth all such as have erred and are deceived. That it may please thee to give us a heart to love and fear thee, and diligently to live after thy commandments. We beseech thee to hear us, Lord. That it may please thee so to rule the hearts of thy servants, the President of the United States, and all others in authority, that they may do justice and love mercy and walk in the ways of truth. We beseech thee to hear us, Lord. That it may please thee to make wars to cease in all the world to give to all nations unity, peace, and concord, and to bestow freedom upon all peoples. We beseech thee to hear us, Lord. That it may please thee to show thy pity upon all prisoners and captives, the homeless and the hungry, and all who are desolate and oppressed. We beseech thee to hear us, Lord. That it may please thee to give and preserve to our use the bountiful fruits of the earth, so that in due time all may enjoy them. That it may please thee to inspire us in our several callings to do the work which thou givest us to do with gladness and singleness as thy singleness of heart as thy servants and for the common good. We beseech thee to hear us, Lord. That it may please thee to preserve all who are in danger by reason of their labor or their travel. We beseech thee to hear us, Lord. That it may please thee to preserve and provide for all women in childbirth, young children and orphans, the widowed, and all whose homes are broken or torn by strife. We beseech thee to hear us, Lord. That it may please thee to visit the lonely, to strengthen all who suffer in mind, body, and spirit, and to comfort with thy presence those who are failing and infirm. We beseech thee to hear us, Lord. That it may please thee to support, help, and comfort all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation. We beseech thee to hear us, that it may please thee to have mercy upon all mankind. We beseech thee to hear us, Lord. That it may please thee to give us true repentance, 
to forgive us all our sins, negligences, and ignorances, and to endue us with the grace of thy Holy Spirit to amend our lives according to thy holy word. That it may please thee to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts. That it may please thee to strengthen such as do stand, to comfort and help the weak-hearted, to raise up those who fall, and finally to beat down Satan under our feet. That it may please thee to grant to all the faithful departed eternal life and peace. That it may please thee to grant that in the fellowship of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints, we may attain to that heavenly kingdom. Son of God, we beseech thee to hear us. Son of God, we beseech you to hear us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world. Grant us thy peace. O Christ, hear us. O Christ, hear us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know the weaknesses of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it, and settle in it. You shall take some of the first fruit of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ.
Please be seated. Well, I've got bad news and I got good news. The bad news is I wrote at least five sermons for church this morning. The good news is I'm only going to do one of them. Uh, now, in some ways, I do want to preach all five of them because they're all five things that are going to be important to us uh, this Lent. But as appealing as that probably sounds to you all to hear all five of them, I, I, I thought it was probably best to just make a decision and stick with one. But we, we do have a lot of ground to cover this Lent, and I have a lot to say about it. You know, Lent starts, I mean, the first Lent began immediately after Jesus was baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's different from being baptized with water by John the Baptist. It does just so happen that, that, uh, that those two events happen at the same time for Jesus. But even John admitted that this was not the same thing as baptism with, uh, with water, the old Jewish baptism. Uh, John even said, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming greater than I, and he will baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. So the evidence that we have that Jesus brought to us for the first time, baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, is that the scriptures say that when Jesus came up out of the water, he was filled up with the Holy Spirit, and he was led by the Spirit. Some translations say he was driven by the Spirit out into the wilderness where he was tempted by the desert, uh, by, the, by the desert, by the devil. Now, baptism of and by the Holy Spirit is not necessarily a topic that you hear spoken of too much in the Episcopal Church, but I have to say that I wonder if that's where we are, if that's where we are headed at Church of the Resurrection, if that's what's coming for us. Because it's a big topic, and it's a big topic for us right now. I hope really big. And it's going to be one of the topics of the sermons in Lent uh, for, the next, uh, for the next while. But we, we may, I didn't land on that sermon today, though, because we may need maybe a sermon or two to get us ready for that sermon, right? To prep us for that sermon. So that's not the one. Actually, I figure if I just tell you what I'm not going to preach about the whole time, I actually don't ever have to get to what I'm going to preach about. So that's one thing that I'm not preaching about today. Um, so two, after Jesus has, has been led into the desert, he settles into his 40 days of prayer and fasting, and that's when the devil shows up, just like he will show up for us. Now, I, I talked about Satan in church last Wednesday, because Ash Wednesday, because you can't really have a serious discussion of Lent, and in fact, you cannot really have a serious Lent without talking about the devil. And we, we very carefully tiptoe around the topic of Satan because we don't want to sound like crazy people, uh, but we're going to have to stop worrying about that. We're going to need to be maybe a little crazier uh, in, our, in our faith and in our, our belief coming up. Jesus believed in the devil, the real live literal devil, and if Jesus believed in him, then I do too. And the reason that we need a sermon about Satan is because if we are taking our lives as Christians seriously, then he will show up, just like he did for Jesus, and he will throw everything he has at us, just like he did to, to Jesus. So we're going to need to talk about the assaults of the devil, but that's not the sermon I'm preaching either. That's too. All right, so something else that needs to be addressed today is, being the first Sunday of Lent, we need to talk about what Lent is and what it means for us, what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. Uh, the church historically has been all over the place with, with Lent. Some generations have attached hundreds of rules and regulations on Lent, and other generations have done just the opposite of that. But I do think Lenten disciplines are important, right? Like I do, I do the fasting on Fridays and, and certain fasts all through the, uh, through the week. I, you know, I try to, uh, to take on the, the five pillars of Lent. We'll talk about those eventually. Um, uh, you know, the church does not do 
something for 1,900 years unless it has some real value to it. And Lent does, and the Lenten disciplines do. Uh, and I still think what I thought on Wednesday, this is not the year for us to soft-pedal Lent. This is not the year for us to soft-pedal anything. But that's not really the sermon for today either. So that's three. So what are you preaching on today, Chad? Well, I had a, a meeting last Thursday with a small group of priests in the diocese. Uh, I was the oldest one there. They were younger priests. Uh, and this group of priests is convinced, as I am, that we are seeing and are about to see, uh, really see, a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit in the church. We were all convinced of it, this whole group. In fact, it's what we were meeting about. Uh, we don't know if this is a regional movement or a denominational movement or a, or a, or a global movement. We have no idea what this is. All we know is that we are convinced that it's coming. Uh, and it was good to kind of uh, come out of the closet with that belief among a few other priests who were there with me uh, because I didn't feel like quite as crazy a crazy man for, for thinking it. They, they, they kind of thought so too. Uh, we all decided that we might be crazy, but it's, it's, it's probably not for this. It's probably for something else. So the first thing that I said to that group, and it's, this is the thing that I feel like I need to say to you as well, the first thing is, I am not a charismatic. I'm not. I never have been a charismatic. Not, you know, not from the early days in my in the evangelical church, and not now. I'm not a charismatic. Uh, I never have been. I am an Anglo Catholic to my very bones. All, although we know some charismatic Anglo Catholics, don't we, Father? Um, uh, I am an Anglo Catholic to my bones, and what I mean by that is that I hold the sacraments in very, very high regard, and I also happen to mean that I'm very traditional in my worship style. I think I always will be, I think, uh, and I also mean that there are certain gifts, certain gifts of the Holy Spirit that I do not at this time possess. Uh, I remain open to the Spirit's movements, but I, I don't strive or yearn for new gifts. I pray that the Holy Spirit will strengthen and hone in me the gifts that he's already given me, and I don't necessarily yearn for the ones I don't have. I do not, for example, and I never have, spoken in tongues. Now, it might surprise you to know how many Episcopalians do have that charism. Uh, it might surprise you to know that there are folks in this room right now who have that particular charism. Now, we're not going to be surprised by the Bahamian contingent over here, right? We know that Byron <laughs> is this close all the time, okay? But I'm not talking about Byron. I'm talking about people. It would never cross your mind if that was a particular charism of theirs. Um, it, it's, it's, not, it's not mine. Uh, I, I do not and have never been the conduit for miraculous healing. Uh, I don't have visions. I don't have any of the more obvious, spectacular gifts like you read about in the Acts of the Apostles, although I do believe that those exist. Now, I hope I'm not going to make a fool of myself when I say this, but I do believe that I have the gift of preaching. I hope that you agree with that. Um, <laughs> I hope I'm not wrong about that, but I, I do think so. And, um, and this may be slightly shocking to you, but I also believe that I may have a small portion of the gift of prophecy, which does not have anything to do with predicting the future, right? That's not what prophecy is. Don't think that's what that is. Now, that's, that's one of the scarier things I've ever heard myself say from the, from the pulpit. Um, but, and, and I know that this kind of talk excites some of you, and I know that it makes others of you really, really uncomfortable, and I will say to you that I am exactly in that place. I can relate to both of those feelings, as I am feeling both of those things with you at the same time. But the sermon that I am preaching, and that I think we, that I will continue to preach until I'm led otherwise, is the one that, that keeps coming to me about spiritual gifts and the manifestation of spiritual gifts because 
I think that we have seen some of those in the parish recently. And if you're asking yourself why Chad keeps talking about the Holy Spirit and keeps bringing this up and is convinced that there's a movement afoot, it's because I believe that I have seen the manifestation of certain gifts in certain people in this parish. I, that what those gifts are might surprise you. Some traditional gifts and some not as traditional. Uh, just a taking of the things that God's people are good at and magnifying those, which is what the Holy Spirit does. And that's the sermon that keeps coming up in my mind. And I keep thinking about a passage from 1 Samuel uh, when God calls one of his greatest servants, uh, the third chapter in 1 Samuel, that begins with, Now the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. And then God called out to the boy Samuel. Uh, for the next decades, uh, the Holy Spirit fell upon the nation of Israel in very real ways, some of the most spectacular ways that have ever been seen in the Old Testament. King Saul, before it went really badly at the end, but if you remember, King Saul was a devoted servant of God uh, at first. And King Saul is often described as being full of the Spirit of God and speaking in prophetic utterances and the presence of God continues to fall upon Samuel at Shiloh and there were miracles and there were healings and there were signs and wonders and here's the thing at that time there rose up a leader the likes of which has never been seen again in the nation of Israel and that leader was King David that's right it was King David. A leader rose up, the likes of which have never been seen since. And the Holy Spirit broke loose as powerfully as on the day of Pentecost. Now, you might think everything was going along just fine in the nation of Israel, right? Because the Holy Spirit was there, and that may be, that may be why uh, the Holy Spirit showed up. But you would be wrong because this was in one of the most difficult times the nation of Israel had ever seen because the Philistines had beaten them almost into annihilation. There were actually not many of them even left. Their days were numbered uh, because the Philistines had just about wiped them off the planet. And that's not the first time that a series of events very similar to this had happened, and the Holy Spirit breaks out among the people. Uh, it happens all through the scriptures. So what do we know about the times in which we are living right now? Uh, well, uh, they're not for the faint of heart, that is for sure. Uh, they have not been easy for the church. In fact, the last two years, and this is what Mary uh, um, uh, Kaiser was talking about in the parish hall earlier, um, the last few years have been so difficult that ministers are leaving the church in droves. 25% of every parish, in every, every congregation in the Diocese of Tennessee is without a priest right now. 25%. That's, am I right? 25%. Um, now, now, I'm not going to, I'm having a ball. Right, I really am. Um, I'm not going anywhere, but I do want to be honest and tell you that I was not having a ball for about 18 months. It's been very recently that I've started having a ball again. I was having a hard time until whatever this is began to happen to me and the Spirit uh, spoke into my heart uh, a couple of months ago. But you all many have been lost to the church. I don't know if that's permanent or not. We will see. Time will will tell, but it's, it's been rough. The economy is shaky, to say the least. Vladimir Putin has lost what little sense God gave him to begin with. Uh, plague, pestilence, and famine. And I'm, I'm being a little lighthearted, but I'm not making light. We, we're having hard times. And it feels like, to me, it feels like open season on the church in a lot of ways. Turn on the television sometime and turn to any channel in the almost any channel on, on the dial and you're you'll see it if you're watching closely enough you know the discovery channel for years has wanted you to believe that 
you know, Christianity is only for the ignorant, right? Or for the aliens, either, either one, right? It's either all because of the aliens or it's all because we're stupid. Um, uh, NPR, and I know I'll get in trouble for saying this, um, but, you know, in, NPR seems to be trying to make a case in the last month uh, that Christianity and even in, in evangelism, that those are tools of subjugation that are used only by colonialists and racists. Uh, I don't know if you've heard that uh, lately on NPR, but they seem to, to say that, that you have to be a racist to be an, uh, an evangelical uh, Christian. And I've decided if they can make those things up about us, then I'm not going to be ashamed of holding the light up uh, on them because we know that's simply not the truth. The word of the Lord is rare in these days. We all know that. Nobody, nobody doubts that, or at least it has been. And hard times coupled with quiet from the Holy Spirit, well, that seems to be the recipe for his breaking out among his people in ways that leaves no room for misinterpretation. And, you, and would you think that I was, was crazy if I said that I believe that we are no longer living in times where the word of the Lord is going to be rare? Would you think I was crazy if I said that? And would you think I was crazy if I told you that I am praying fervently with my whole heart that the Holy Spirit will raise up among the Holy Church Catholic a leader that will hold the standard high enough that we will all be able to rally around it because I feel like we're missing it. And whether that leader is a St. Athanasius or a Billy Graham or a firebrand evangelical bishop, I don't care. We just need someone to rally us just somebody to spearhead our movement of revival. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will reach into the hearts of these staid Episcopalians, of whom I am the most staid, and remind them of the gifts that they have been given and make manifest in them those gifts in new and powerful and profound ways. So this Lent, this year, is a time for us to put the house in order to have a real and a serious Lent. Fasting? Yes, indeed. If Jesus needed to fast, then we do too. Penitence? The second of those five pillars. Penitence? Well, we cannot be the conduit for the Holy Spirit if we are filled up with something other than the things of God, like our sins, for instance. We have to sweep out all of the dark corners and turn from our sins and ask for forgiveness. Almsgiving, number three, well, it's not optional for the people of God. We give to the poor, and we do for the poor, and the hungry, and the sick, and the friendless, and the needy. Study, well, if you're, uh, uh, study without question, and if you are looking for a great place to start, let me guide you to the book of Acts. Open up the book of Acts and reintroduce yourself to the Holy Spirit. And then the last of those five pillars of Lent is prayer. And folks, I mean it this year. We have to pray like we have never prayed before. And if you don't know what to pray for, just pray. And God will point you in the right direction. Pray like your life depends on it and like the life of the church depends on it. Because it just might. Lent has always been the season we use to prepare us for something, something that's coming, Easter or baptism or new work. And it's the same today. And the bigger the thing is that's coming, the harder we're called to prepare. Well, the biggest thing that we have seen in generations in the old mainline church is coming. It's coming to the church. And if we fall on our knees and repent of our sins and open our hearts to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and His grace, we'll be ready for it when it comes. Amen. We believe in one God.
the Father and the Almighty, and maker of heaven and earth, of all that has been seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten of my name, of one being with the Father, through him all things remain. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified on the conscious pilot. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in the words of the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. So when you do the litany, you don't have prayers of the people. So I know that we have some birthdays today. Uh, Miss Ann Quillen. When is your birthday, Miss Ann Quillen? It's today. Happy birthday. Come on next week. <laughs> Bobby, yours is this week, isn't it? Come on, Bobby and Miss Ann Dotson. And anybody else? Who else am I missing? Anybody need to make up? All right. Okay. You'll be 12, 10 years old. I won't, I won't ask. <laughs> 80. It's a big one. Look at that. Happy birthday. Um, watch over the Easter servants on my device their days. Thank you for sending them to us. Thank you for making them exactly who they are. Send your Holy Spirit into their hearts to make them more of what they are and more of what you want them to be. Bless them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy birthday. We love y'all. Uh, and uh, any anniversaries today? We lost it. Oh, there they are. I couldn't find you. You weren't even ready for the spot. We didn't tweet each other. Did you love y'all last week? We didn't do y'all last week? How many years ago? Fifty-five. Yeah, you know, your fingers and so. Where, where are you? Are you all married at Advent? You're married at St. George's. 
That's people that married a lot of, a lot of Episcopalians, <laughs> haven't they? They did. <laughs> so you were married in the old church then, yes. right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And Sissy Sobel's daddy was the senior warden that started that church. Did you know that? You did know that. You know that? Right. Bless these, your servants, Almighty God, and create in their hearts a home built for you. Uh, and bless their own home. Fill it with your Holy Spirit. Fill it with the love that you have, that you have for them and that they have for each other. And on that great last day, bring them to that heavenly home where they will worship with you forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You, sir, let me kiss the bride. <laughs>
to let you all in on a little something. Susie and I are having a great theological debate. She says that the center is the center of the altar. And I say that the center is the center of the aisle, right there. It's a hugely significant theological event. So when you see us pulling this cloth back and forth, that's what we're doing. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewed by your word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which you have prepared for those who love you. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, 
And bring us to that heavenly country where with the ever-blessed Virgin Mary and all your saints, we may enter, enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. For Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Lamb of God, you take gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you forever. Amen.
waiting for my post load to end. Oh, wow. Well.